Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to give you guys uh, an update from, from Florida. And, uh, the COVID situation here is pretty bad. Mm. Uh, I, have two sis- I have two sisters that are kind of in the Florida public system. One is a, uh, or was a, up until last week a teacher in an elementary school near Tampa. Um, I think I wrote a, a message a few a few months ago about the AC being broken. I don't know if you remember that they had a broken AC and yes. they couldn't open the windows and doors. Yes. Right. So so it's been five, about five months and the AC was still broken, still broken, still hasn't been fixed, and they're still not allowed to uh, open the door because of you know school shooters. Um, so she was the only teacher there that spoke Spanish. Everyone else was just an English speaker in Tampa which is an area that is like the bluest, one of the bluest areas in Florida, and it's full of uh, uh, Hispanic immigrant children. Uh, so she was the only Spanish speaker in the school. Uh, she found a job at a, at a nearby university uh, that paid about the same, and the hours were like half the time. So she ended up leaving uh, the profession now. Um, she's much happier, but she, it took her about a month to decide because, you know, the kids, and that's what they, right. what they do. Um, so... When she put in her two-week notice, uh, she also tested positive for COVID uh, a couple of days after. So she notified the school, and the school said, come in anyway. We need you for those two weeks. Um, she ended up taking the, the sick days that she has. She had left uh, to not show up. But um, there's, they're, they're doing nothing about COVID. Um, and the same thing is going on in the University of Florida. One of my sisters is there. Uh, she tested positive, and she stayed off campus. And then uh, uh, once she wanted to come back on campus, she started uh, emailing the administration, all the uh, calling the phone numbers that are given out to to ask what to do. Um, she didn't get any answers for about uh, two days. The professors were not sure about the protocols. The state health department never responded. No guidance at all. Uh, so it, it's just complete abdication of any kind of duty uh, to the public. So, I mean, at least right now, we're kind of used to dealing with COVID, but I don't know what's going to happen uh, in a few years when something else, some other uh, disease appears, you know? Uh, the, the, whole, the whole health system has been completely deteriorated purposefully, you know, to just not make COVID into a big deal, at least in Florida. Uh, it's going to be a disaster. If, if, if it was already a disaster, before this because it wasn't put together uh, purposefully. Now it's being destroyed pur- purposefully and nobody's taking any kind of action to, you know, fix it for the future. Um, it's pretty bleak. It, I mean, it's it, that that seems very much in keeping with everything we've heard coming out of Florida, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear all of that. Um, and I hope the rest of your family's all right, Dr. Gus. Yeah, everyone's vaccinated and kind of survive, surviving okay. So in that, in that sense, I'm pretty lucky. Um, before I go, I also wanted to say uh, Matt Lex's uh, tweet about Bolsonaro uh, going broke here in the U.S. actually <laughs> right, right wing Brazilian WhatsApp. So oh. He's, he's reaching far. It is pretty impressive. Oh, my God. No way. Well, that I retweeted that as soon as I saw you put that out. That was pretty hilarious, Matt. Yeah, I tweeted out. There's a, there's a news story. Bolsonaro promised that if Lula wins the upcoming elections in the first round, he will leave Brazil. Uh, he says I'm going to the United States, and I said uh, he'll be broke from the from U.S. medical bills before <laughs> half a year. And I didn't notice. Like I got I got in the office today. I'm like it had, it had like something like six thousand. Oh my likes. god, ten point five k likes right now. Yeah, scroll Matt. down a little bit, Bradley. It's going. Yeah, it has one like for every time Bolsonaro has gotten COVID <laughs> in the past two years. <laughs> Oh, well, so now you're probably getting a bunch of uh, interesting replies. That's all right. Uh, uh, what's, uh, how do you say welcome in uh, Portuguese? Uh, uh, do you know, know, Dr. Gus? Do- Dr. Gus? Oh, I actually don't know. I, I just have friends. Uh, I speak Spanish. So, okay, gotcha. Uh, I'm just another friend. Yeah. Well, I appreciate <laughs> it. Have a good one. And thanks, thanks for uh, wait, the call. Wait, don't, let me go. Don't let me go. One, one last thing. Oh, okay. Thing. I thought you said last uh, thing that so- time. Yeah, I know. I just, I just. Uh, no, I just mean I, I didn't I mean to hang up to on you. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, so, just you guys were talking about Nate Silver. I just wanted to say, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Brandon said, I'm not a real doctor. I'm a veterinarian. I went to school, uh, you know, animal medicine. Then I did a master's in in clinical uh, 
uh, clinical trial uh, stuff. Then I'm doing a PhD in uh, molecular biology, infectious disease with bacteria. I've taken, I don't know, like eight or nine classes, graduate level classes in epidemiology, disease modeling, all that stuff with infectious disease. And I am not qualified to say very much at all about COVID, about uh, what's going to happen with the disease, anything to do with the epidemiology of the disease. So if I'm not qualified, Nate Silver is fucking delusional. <laughs> Don't pay attention to what that guy said. He was already stretching himself when he jumped into politics. Right mm -hmm. now, he's, I don't know, in Absolutely. a different world. He needs it, to it, it, oh, I yeah, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I, I want to say, you know, you're better than a doctor. You know, you're a friend of the show. <laughs> no, but no, I mean, Nate Silver is the kind of expert that a, a country full of people who can't calculate 20% of a, you know, a hundred dollar tip, you know, in their head kind of get when it's like the illusion of math and the illusion of science become inextricably linked to this desire to have a predictive model for the universe where that, that you know, this place that science went in the past 30 years where it's like, okay, we're not doing descriptive sociology or descriptive psychology. Those like the big focus is on how do we use like this stuff to predict the future and more pop psycho, you know, psychology, pop like sociology, pop like statistics way. And, you know, uh, our society just is not like as interested in teaching people statistics or math or any of that stuff enough to, for it to be anything other than like a, you know, a divergence from like what we should actually be talking about and how we should be talking about it to be like, you know, it's similar to like sports betting, no offense, Emma. But I mean, to that point, I think, and also to the point, you know, to your point in the point of the earlier bashful caller from Chicago, uh, you know, we're watching our infrastructure across the board fail us, you know, and there is just a entire goal of the institutions that have been in charge of maintaining those, that infrastructure, you know, making sure teachers are, you know, schools are staffed, making sure that that, you know, there's uh, like HVAC systems that schools have, you know, uh, the ability to maintain, you know, have a small student to teacher ratio, you know, not to mention our hospitals, like nurses, uh, number of rural hospitals closing. There's just been like this concerted effort to disguise how how far that was degrading over the past 30, 40 years. And now that we need all that stuff, the question of where it is has to be like papered over with various, you know, methods like, okay, Republicans will tell you there is no COVID. So why do you need a hospital? Like you're not sick, go back to work. You know, and Democrats and their aligned punditry, they, you know, they might not like the ultimate, like, you know, Nate Silvers and the people complaining about schools closing, they might not like the ultimate effect of their politics, but they love having monetized the flow laws. And so the more frustrating part is you have people who are like, I want schools to be open right now. I don't, I haven't supported anything over the past 30 years that would be possible to make uh, schools be open. But I would like to have this conversation about why schools should be open in a manner that does not address those past 30 years or my positions up until this point, which make that impossible. And so we just, you know, we find ourselves going back and forth with a system that will, like you said, in five years when we still haven't built the infrastructure and we're still living under this illusion that like well when there's a real big problem we'll get things together this doesn't count though you know we'll just see that like a real big problem you know is it's never going to rise we just have like an illusion that we're going to be able to we have an illusion or we've maintained an illusion that we're able to deal with mass scale problems and tragedy in a coherent way because we just ignore like the fact that they never get solved